Okay, I'm going to get started with today's class. Last class we we talked about electric electric fields. We introduced electric fields. Today's class I want to introduce a new concept, electric flux, and we're going to talk about electric flux. So we're basically moving on from one abstract quantity, electrical field, to a second abstract quantity, electrical flux. And so like we had to learn to kind of appreciate or understand the electrical field and its role in electrical forces, we got to learn to understand, appreciate the role of electrical flux uh, in electrical forces. There's a few things I want to work through today. I've listed them here. So the first thing I want to do is really introduce the concept, talk about the definition of electric flux. So that's this first item in, in, in red here. And in the context of that, um, as I talk about uh, electric flux, define electric flux, we're going to talk about also the concept of what we call open surfaces and closed surfaces. The second item that I want to look at is what's called Gauss's law. Um, Gauss's law will tell us that it's a new way of thinking about charges. It's a way of thinking about charges, electrical charges as the this, what we call the sources and the sinks of electrical flux. So we'll explain that. And then thirdly, I want to look at examples, illustrations of electrical flux and Gauss's law in which we'll use the concepts of electrical flux and Gauss's law. We'll use them to calculate electrical fields. We'll use them to understand distributions of distributions of charge. And so that that'll be the, the third item for today. I mean, hopefully. Okay, so let me begin with just the that idea that concept of electrical flux and a definition, a precise def definition of electrical flux. So on the, on the left here, this is um, an example, not of electrical flux, but of what I might call water flux. And I took this at home last night in my kitchen sink and I wanted it as an illustration, example of water flux. See, in my kitchen sink, think about the water, there's a, there's a source of water, the faucet. And so here you see this, the source of water. Water in the sink is coming up, oh, do that every time. Water in the sink is coming from the faucet. Here it is landing in the sink. Um, and then there's a drain, a, a drain um, in which the water is disappearing. And so if I, I look at the water flowing in the sink, I can think about a two important things are the source of the water and the drain for the water, where the water is disappearing. And that's water flux, but we can think about electrical flux in a very similar way, in a very analogous way. So we can think of positive charges, and uh, here's a positive charge. We can think of positive charges as a source of electrical flux, like the faucet was the um, source of uh, water flux. And we can think of negative charges as the kind of the drain, the sink for uh, electrical, electrical field, where the where the field lines disappear. So the, the water appeared out of the faucet and went down the drain. The field lines, the electrical field appears out of the positive charge here. The field lines come out of the positive charge and then they, um, they flow into the negative charge. It's like the drain. 
and the pattern of water from the source to the drain, the analogous thing of that is the pattern of field lines from the positive charge source to the negative charge drain. And so that's the basic idea we're going to work with today. Sort of new idea that just like the faucet and the drain in our sink are where the water comes from and where the water ends up, positive charges and negative charges are kind of where the field lines come from and where the field lines end up. And we're going to make this quantitative. We're going to make this idea quantitative. Okay, so as we do that, there's one Im important thing I want to mention. It's a difference between when we talk about electrical field and when we talk about electrical flux. So it's a difference between field and flux. When we talk about field, we think about the field at a, at a location, a point in space. So if I, I tell you the um, electrical field, I would have to tell you the point in space I'm referring to. So in Magenta here is the electrical field vector, a given point in space. When we start talking about electrical flux, to describe the electrical flux, I have to analogously tell you about some surface. So here's a surface, and I would have to tell you the, I could tell you the flux through that surface, the, the electrical flux that's permeating that surface. So there's a, there's a difference right off between our descriptions of electrical fields, our descriptions of electrical fluxes. When we're thinking about fields, we're thinking about the field at the point in space. When we're thinking about flux, we're thinking about the flux through a surface in space. Okay, so now let's get on to a definition. So this slide defines for us the electrical flux. It's a, an equation. It's a formula. It's an expression that defines the electrical flux. And so uh, here is the expression. Let me just walk through it. So firstly, phi is the symbol that we give to flux. And when we talk about electrical flux, um, we often hang a subscript on it a subscript E to indicate electric flux. Sometimes I will do that. Uh, we tend to do it when there could be an ambiguity between electrical flux or some other type of flux. Uh, often when we're working problems with electrical flux and there's no ambiguity, we won't put the subscript E on it. But anyway, I have here. So the electrical flux is deter defined in terms of the electrical field and a surface. And so in the sketch below, I pictured an electrical field. I pictured it in terms of field lines. And I've also written it as an electrical field vector here. And I pictured a surface immersed in that field. So here's the outline of the surface. And you see that it's immersed in that field. The field lines are passing through that surface. And I'm describing the surface by a vector. And I've called it A for area. And that vector has a certain length to it uh, that represents the number of square centimeters or number of square millimeters of the area. And it has an orientation, a direction to it. And that direction of the area vector is perpendicular to the surface, right angles, normal to the surface. And so my sketch shows you an electrical field that we describe by a vector with a magnitude and direction. And it shows you an area, a surface, which we describe also by a vector uh, with a magnitude and direction and the electrical flux through the surface of the electrical field that's passing through the surface is defined in terms of those, those quantities, the E and the A describing the electrical field and the surface area. Um, there's a couple of ways you'll see it written. There's a couple of ways we'll write it. 
Let's start with this way here. This says that the electrical flux through that surface is the area of the surface. So I've not put the symbol for a vector on this area. It just means the size of the surface multiplied by the perpendicular component of the electrical field, the, the piece of the electrical field, part of the electrical field that's right angle to the surface. That's what this right angle here means. And so that's one way of defining the electrical field. It's just the product of the area of the surface times the cross-sectional, times the electrical field that's perpendicular to that surface. Second way of defining the electric flux is this way here. They're equivalent, but this is an alternative way of doing it. E here is just the strength of the electrical field. A here is just the magnitude of the surface area. And the cosine theta, well, that's the angle between the vector E and the vector A. In this case, that angle is zero degrees. But in general, it wouldn't be zero degrees. And so that's a second way of um, defining flux. And so that's our, that's our master definition for this new quantity of electrical flux. Um, as a comment in the chat, I'm having difficulty understanding the concept of what A represents. It's surface area represented by a vector. Yes, so that's an important concept. The surface area of this surface, we can represent by a vector. The bigger that surface, the longer the vector. The smaller the surface, the smaller the vector. So the length of the vector represents the number of square millimeters, number of square meters, or the number of square centimeters of the surface. The orientation of the vector, the direction of the vector represents the orientation or direction of the surface. So that vector A, I drew it perpendicular, right angles to the surface itself. If I was to rotate the surface, if I was to change the orientation of the surface, the vector A would rotate or orientate. So that vector A importantly contains the information about the size of the surface and the orientation of the surface. So this is our definition of electric flux. Um, there's another way, a sort of more wordy, friendly way of thinking about the electrical flux. If you've got a surface in an electrical field, the electrical flux through the surface in the electrical field is in proportion to the number of field lines that are passing through that surface. So the more, meaning the more field lines that pass through the surface, the more electrical flux through the surface, the less field lines, the less electrical flux. I've got on the next few slides, just a few illustrations of surfaces in electrical fields and their electrical flux to hopefully make this a little more concrete. But this is the basic definition. Okay, so look, this slide, the next slide and the slide after that are all examples or illustrations in the relationship between flux and field. In this particular slide, I'm showing you that the flux depends on the area of the surface. So in this slide, I got a uniform electrical field. Look, the field lines just sweep left to right always in the same direction. The field strength is constant. The field lines are always evenly spaced. So this is a picture, a sketch, a diagram of a uniform electrical field. In that field, I've got three surfaces. This big one over here on the left, 10 square meters. This medium sized one in the center, one square meter. And this small one over here on the right, 0.1 square meters. So there are three different sized surfaces in the same uniform electrical field. And that affects the flux through those three surfaces. So let me just calculate the flux through each of the, each of the surfaces. So let's do this, um, this case of the large surface. The flux is the perpendicular component of the electrical field times the area of the surface. Well, the entire field here is perpendicular to this surface. That's what I tried to sketch. And so the perpendicular component in the electrical field is 
50 newton coulombs. The area of the surface is 10 square meters. And so multiplying those, that's the flux, 500 newton, 500 newton meter square per coulomb through that surface. For the medium sized surface, what's the flux there? Again, it's the perpendicular component of the electrical field times the area of this surface. The electrical field is exactly the same. It's still 50 newtons per coulomb, but the area is now 10 times smaller. It's only one square meter. And so that flux for that surface is just 50 newton meter square per coulomb. And then finally over here on the, on the right, this is the smallest surface. The flux through that surface is again, the strength of the electrical field that the surface is immersed in still 50 newtons per coulomb multiplied by the area of that surface is now 0.1 meters squared and that comes out to be five newtons meters squared per coulomb and so you see here how different size surfaces different area surfaces in the same constant electrical field have different fluxes through those surfaces so you see that the flux does depend obviously on the on the surface itself Second example. So this is another illustration of the relationship between flux, the new quantity and the field, the quantity from the last class. In this case, I'm showing you that the flux depends also on the strength or the size of the field. So in this particular case, look at this field. It's kind of an interesting one. Over here on the left, the field is strong. 15 newtons per coulomb is the field strength. And you can see it because the field lines are tightly packed together. So look how closely packed the field lines here. In the center right, the field is weaker. It's now only 10 newtons per coulomb. And you can see that because the field lines are now more loosely packed. There's less of them in the center. And then finally, over on the far right, right? The, the field is even weaker. It's now just five newtons per coulomb. And you can see that because the field lines are even more loosely packed over here on the far, far right. So this is a region of space where the field is changing from left to right. In the previous example, this region of space, the field was constant. Into this field that is changing, I have placed three surfaces. These surfaces are identical. One square meter over here on the left, one square meter surface over here in the center, one square meter over here on the right. And let's just calculate the flux through those surfaces. Again, we're always using the same equation. Just multiply the area by the perpendicular component of the electrical field. For the case on the left, that's where the electrical field is large. So 15 newtons per coulomb times one square meter is given to give us a flux that's relatively large is 15 newton meters square per coulomb. In the center here, now the flux is smaller. Flux is smaller, sorry, the field is smaller. And so when I calculate the flux, I'm gonna again, multiply the perpendicular component of the electrical field times the area of the surface as 10 newtons per coulomb multiplied by one square meter, I get just a flux of 10 newton meters per square per coulomb. And then finally, you can see the pattern here, right? Here's the smallest surface. When Here's the smallest field. When I multiply that smaller field by that one square meter, I get a flux that's just five newton meters square per coulomb. And so this illustrates that the surfaces were the same. They were the same size, they were the same orientation but the um, fields were different. A bigger field will mean bigger flux. A smaller field will mean smaller flux. So we're seeing that on this slide. I got one more of these. Here we are. This again, this again is a illustration of the relationship between flux and field old quantity last class, new quantity this class. This time, 
it's an illustration of how the flux depends on the orientation of the surface in the field or the orientation of the field on the surface, the relative orientation, of those two vectors, the field and the surface. So look, over here on the, um, on, the, on the left, the surface is perpendicular to the field lines, which means that the area vector is represented by this red arrow is actually parallel to the field lines. So that's the area vector. In the center here, I've got the same size surface, but now it's orientated so that, look, the surface is parallel to the field lines. The area vector, the area vector is perpendicular to the field lines because it's perpendicular to the surface. And then finally, over here on the far right, I've got neither of those two extremes, right? This, this, this surface is orientated at some angle in the electrical field where the area vector with respect to the electrical field direction is at an angle of 30 degrees. And so those are three examples of three different orientations. Okay, so now I'm gonna use our definition of flux. I'm gonna use this definition, it's handier here. It's the strength of the field times the area of the surface times the cosine of the angle between the area vector and the and the field vector and just calculate the fluxes. So for the left-hand case, uh, field is 50 newtons per coulomb, uh, area is one square meter, and the angle between the field vector and the area vector is zero degrees. So it's cosine zero degrees. Cosine zero degrees is one. And so you get 50 newtons meter squared per coulomb of flux through that surface. Uh, same thing, same procedure for this, the surface in the center, right? It's the field strength times the area of that surface, one square meter times the cosine of the angle between the area vector and the um, area and vector and the field vector. And, and that angle now is 90 degrees. The field vector is going towards the right and the area vector is going downwards. And so, that cosine of 90 degrees is zero. This flux is zero. And I see a question in chat. I'll, I'll answer it in a moment once I get through this slide. Um, finally, the surface over here on the far right, again, it's one square meter. It's in the same strength field, but it's a different orientation. I'll use this product of strength of the field times the area of the surface times the cosine of the angle between the area vector and the field vector. Now the, air, the, the angle is 30 degrees. 30 degrees, cosine of 30 degrees, um, that's, that's not zero, that's not one. It's somewhere in between, it's 0.87. And um, if I multiply the field strength by the area by cosine of 30 degrees, I get this intermediate flux. It's not the 50 newtons per coulomb, meter squared per coulomb, it's not the zero, it's somewhere in between because the orientation is somewhere in between. And so that's a, the final example of how things depend on, um, how things depend on uh, orientation. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Izzy that says, how is a field determined? In these examples here, I'm telling you the field. I'm not saying how I made this field, how I produced this field, how I constructed that field. Um, if you, last class, we did look at examples of how you can calculate the field, calculate the field of a point charge or calculate the field of an arrangement of point charges. So just to be clear, I had never told you how I made these three fields in these last three slides. Just believe me, I made them. And I'm just telling you, showing you, describing how you can calculate the flux through a surface knowing the field. So all these calculations of the flux, we had to know the field, we had to know the surface, we just had to put those two ingredients together. Okay, I wanted to show a quick demonstration of uh, electrical flux. So let me just do that. I'm going to just 
share, uh, stop sharing the screen, I think, for this. I can do that. Okay, so, so maybe you see me now. And I've got, I don't know where to put this so you can see it. Uh, I've got, I'm going to roll back a bit, but then my headphones are going to come off. I've got this little model here. Now, what? these are the electrical field lines. So imagine this is an electrical field. So I've not, again, I've not told you how I made this electrical field. Just imagine this electrical field. And then I've got two surfaces through that are immersed in this electrical field. This one that's at an angle with respect to the field lines. So that's this, this one here, this larger surface here. And then if you can see it, there's one that's perpendicular to the surface, to the field lines, it's this one here. And this too is an example of that relationship between field, surface, and flux. These two surfaces actually have the same flux through them. The field lines that pass through the, the, the perpendicular surface also pass through the angled surface. So they have the same flux through them, if I count the field lines. Now, they have different area surfaces. This one here, this guy is bigger. This one over here is smaller, but they also have different orientations. This one, the smaller surface is perpendicular to the field. This one, the larger surface is at an angle to the field. And so again, if you think of that definition of flux as the field times the area times the cosine of the angle between the field direction and the surfaces direction, the different, the areas are different, but the orientations are different and you end up with the same flux through these surfaces. So I hope that's a, a, an illustration example of flux too. Okay, let's do a little calculation to prove that we know what we're doing. Uh, to prove that I know how to calculate flux. So I can't prove I know what I'm doing. And what we're gonna do is calculate the flux through a cube. Just through a, just a little cube. In this example, right, my, my cube is, um, is one, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter and it's immersed in it's immersed in a, um, uh, an electrical field, a uniform electrical field that is, that is one 500 Newtons per Coulomb. Now I've lost chat again, I always lose chat. So let me see if I can get chat back. Uh, there is a question. So what defines the surface, the electrical field? And no, the, the, that's a, a good point. The electrical field is something completely separate from the surface, right? I define the electrical field by placing some charges at various different places. I define the surface by, you know, maybe I got a piece of cardboard and I cut a shape in it. That defines the surface. And then I put it at a certain orientation in the electrical field. So the surface and the electrical field are not connected in that one defines the other. However, once you've got an electrical field and you've got a surface, you can answer the question of what is the flux through that surface with that equation, with that definition. Um, let, me, let me calculate the flux of electrical field through this cube. So let's do that. And I'm gonna try and do it pretty quickly because it's actually a, a relatively simple calculation given the examples we've now looked at. So to do this calculation, I'm not gonna in one shot, right? Calculate the flux through the entire cube. I'm gonna to work towards that. Rather, first, I'm going to calculate the flux through the surfaces 
the six surfaces that make up the cube. So the cube's got a top, a bottom, a front, a back, and a left and a right. I'm going to go through calculating the flux through those, through those six surfaces. Now, actually, there's four surfaces through which there is actually no flux in this situation. And that's this first slide. And then there's two surfaces, left and right, in which there is a flux. And so that's going to be the next slide. So, so, so let's just break up the... I'm going to break up the calculation of the six flux through six surfaces into the ones that have no flux through them. We'll see why. And the ones that do have a flux through them, we'll see why there. So the important point here is look at the sketch of the situation. The field here, the electrical field, remember it's uniform, is going from left to right. So that field, imagine the field lines. The field lines, they are actually parallel to the top surface or perpendicular to the vector A. They're parallel to the bottom surface or perpendicular to the vector A representing the top bottom surface. Front surface, back surface. The field is perpendicular to the vector A that represents the front surface and the back surface. So this sketch here, what I drew on this sketch was the E field direction. So the direction of that vector and the area vectors of the top, bottom, front and back surfaces. And you notice that the area vectors of those four surfaces are all perpendicular to the electrical field vector. So with that, in mind, let's go to the calculation of the flux through the top, bottom, and front, and back. All of them, I'm going to use the same equation. The product of the field strength times the area size, the area of a face, times the cosine of the angle between the area vector and the electrical field vector. But look, each area vector is right angles to the field. The angle is 90 degrees in each case. And the cosine of 90 degrees, uh, the cosine of 90 degrees is uh, zero. And so all of these fluxes are zero. Uh, there's a, another question in chat and um, I'm reading it. Um, it seems like surface area is determined as the Y coordinate times the X coordinate of the surface. Um, I would say, and then in parentheses, it says length times the width of the sh shape. It is for all of these surfaces, right? The area, if I wanted the area vector, it would be, you know, width times depth or width times length. Uh, here, this one, it would be width times height. This one over here, it would be width or depth here times the, the height. Uh, it's not always an X times a Y or a Y times a Z or any other combination because that depends on the orientation. It's always, if you've got a, you know, a rectangular surface is the, the, the width times the, um, width times the length. Okay, there's a, question about how can the surface be applied to a three-dimensional surface. Um, so we've got we're, this problem, we're working out the flux through a three-dimensional surface, a cube, but we've broken it down into six two-dimensional surfaces. So right now I'm applying my formula to this, this front surface here, it's two-dimensional, and the field is parallel to the surface or perpendicular to A. I'm applying it to this top surface up here. Again, the field is parallel to that surface and perpendicular to A. And so that's how I'm able to use that formula. Okay, let me, so I hope I've convinced you that there is no flux of the field through the top, the bottom, the front, and the back surfaces of this cube. 
The only other ones we haven't dealt with yet are the left and the right. Let me show you the left and right. Let's see if this answers all your questions. I mean, your questions are great. It's good to have those questions coming in. Um, uh, and they're making my brain go to like a thousand miles per hour. Okay, what about the, the left and right faces? So here's the, just to be clear, here's the right face of the cube. And we can't really see it fully, but here is the outline of the left face of the cube. Now these are a little different because look, representing those surfaces by their area vectors. Remember the area vectors have a length that's the size of the surface and point in a direction that's perpendicular to the surface. Those area vectors, there's one over here for the left and one over here for the right, they conventionally point out of a closed surface like this sphere, like this, this cube here. Those vectors are either in the direction of the electrical field or opposite the direction of the electrical field. And so they are orientated quite differently from the top face, the bottom face, the front face, and the back face. So let's calculate the flux through the right face and the left face. Look, I'm using the same formula as I did in the last slide. Strength of field times area of the surface times the cosine of the angle between the area vector and the electrical field vector. But what's the key difference? Now look, for the right face, it's the one over here, E and A are in the same direction. Zero degrees between the vector E and A. For the left face, E and A are in opposite directions. A is towards the, to the left over here and E is towards the right. A is in the negative X direction, E is in the positive X direction. So they're oppositely directed. So I've got an angle of zero degrees for the cosine and 180 degrees for the cosine when I'm calculating the flux through the right and left faces. Okay, so now let's calculate the flux through the right face. It's 500 newtons per coulomb, the field strength times 0 0.01 meters, the height of that, that face times 0 0.01 meters times the width of that face times the cosine of zero degrees, which is a one. And if I multiply all those things together, I get 0 0.05 Newton meters squared per coulomb. So that's the flux through the right face. Left face, I've got the um, strength of the field, 500 newtons per coulomb. I got the um, uh, height and the width of the left face, 0 0.01 meters, 0 0.01 meters. And I've got a minus sign here. This is from the, um, the cosine of 180 degrees. It gives me minus one. So I could have multiplied by minus one over here on the right. And so that flux, well, look, the flux through the right face was positive 0 0.05. The flux through the left face is now going to be negative 0 0.05. We would say that the flux is coming out of the right face. The flux is going into the left face. It's because the field lines come out of the right face and go into the left face. Let's me, let me have another look at chat. Okay, so Ricky, is flux always positive when the field lines are exiting a surface and negative when the field lines are entering a surface? Yeah. Basically, the answer to that is yes. So when you have a closed surface, so the cube overall is a closed surface, right? If you're inside the cube, you would have to break through the walls of the cube to get outside. If you're outside, you'd have to break through the walls to get inside. When you have a closed surface, the convention is that positive flux is the field coming out, the field lines coming out. Negative flux is the field lines going in, the field going inside. So in this example, the right, the right face of a closed surface has a positive flux out, the left face has a negative flux in. So that's our convention. Uh, there's a question, will the shapes we use to calculate flux always have well-defined surfaces? 
Um, yeah, yes, they will have. I mean, so you can calculate flux through rectangular shapes like we've been doing. We can calculate, we'll see an example of flux calculating through a sphere. But if I gave you some arbitrary blob, right, we'd never be able to calculate the flux through it. It'd be too complicated to calculate flux through it. Um, the block is empty. Just imagine the block is empty. It's just, just imaginary, it's a, 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 a imaginary cube. And we're just thinking about the surfaces of it. We don't need to worry about what's inside, what's outside. It's just a surface, an imaginary surface. Okay, what about the flux through the entire cube now? Well, now that's easy. This, so this was the question that we were asked that I was gonna solve in like 30 seconds. Um, so what is the flux through the entire cube? Well, the flux through the entire cube is just that the sum of the fluxes through the six faces of the cube. So we've just got to add up all those fluxes through the left, right, top, bottom, front, back faces. And that's all we're going to do here. Well, here's the left face flux, negative 0 0.05. Here's the right face flux, positive 0 0.05. And all the others were zero, no flux. When we add these up, we get zero. There's zero net flux through this cube. And actually, there's zero net flux through any shape, whether it's a cube, a sphere, a cone, or a blob, or a person in a uniform electrical field. And so that's a useful result. I'm not proving that result that any shape has zero flux through it, but you can if you're in a uniform electrical field. If you're in a non-uniform electrical field, that's not true. But if you're in a uniform electrical field, that's true. Okay, well, that was fun. Now Gauss's law. Now we got to introduce Gauss's law. That was the second topic. So Gauss's law, you might know this guy. guy. Well, I mean, you don't personally know him, but um, Carl Gauss is a tremendously famous mathematician and also a very famous scientist. I believe they call him, I don't know who the king and queen of mathematics are, but they used to call him the prince of mathematics. And he made these huge contributions to science and um, mathematics. And um, the law that we're going to describe is called Gauss's law. It's due to Carl Gauss. And I think of it, it's interesting, it's an alternative way of describing how electrical interactions work. Coulomb's law was a way of describing how electrical interactions work. Gauss's law is another way, alternative way of describing how electrical interactions work. And sometimes having two ways of describing how something works gives you new insight into the workings of that electrical force or whatever that thing is. And so, Gauss's law, Coulomb's law, are different ways of thinking about the electrical interaction. They also give you different ways of solving electrical interaction problems. So that's another great use of Gauss's law, Coulomb's law. Enough of that history. I, I always get in the comments at the end of the semester, stop talking about the history of things and get on with it. Get on with the problems. Okay. So this is on this slide. I presented Gauss's law. And it's really quite a simple law. Now to imagine Gauss's law, firstly, you've got to imagine a closed surface. So the, the reason I did the cube that created so many Zoom chats was that the cube is an example, illustration of a closed surface. As I say, if, if you trap me inside the cube, I'd have to break through the walls of the cube to get out. Or if I was outside the cube and wanted to get into it, I'd have to, I'd have to break through the walls to get in. There's no, there's no root. That's what, what a closed surface is. The other type of surface is an open surface, right? If I just had a sheet of paper, if I wanted to get from one side to the other side, I just walk around the sheet of paper. 
I wouldn't need to crash my way through the, um, the sheet of paper. That would be ridiculous. Um, anyway, so Gauss's law about, is about closed surface. Now it could be a cube or it could be a sphere or it could be some more general blob. And I've tried to imagine here on this slide some sort of really general blob. Here's the outline of it. Here's a very poor outline of it. Gauss's law says that the electrical flux through the closed surface is in proportion to the total charge that's inside the closed surface. Here's the flux. Here's the charge inside the closed surface. Here's the charge inside the closed surface. And look, the flux is in proportion to the charge inside the closed surface. The flux is in proportion to the charge inside the closed surface here. There's a proportionality constant. It's four pi times the Coulomb constant. Or alternatively, it's sometimes written as one over epsilon naught, which is called the permeativity of space, of permeativity of free space. Both these ways of using Gauss's law. The important thing is flux is proportional to charge inside the surface. And there's a proportionality constant. You can just look up the Coulomb constant. Remember, it's 9 times 10 to the 9. Uh, you can look up this permeativity, this epsilon. It's like 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 12, if I remember it right. Okay, so that's Gauss's flux law. So I like, I mean, it's a nice simple law, isn't it? It's really much simpler than Coulomb's law for the relationship between the force or the field and the charge. This is a simple relationship between flux and the charge. So we, we got to love it for that reason alone. That's why I like it anyway. So this is so Lady Gaga's here. I can't remember why she came for this, but it, she's going to offer an explanation in terms of sheep. So here's the explanation. The important thing about this um, flux law. I knew I was going to do that too. I didn't know I was going to do it twice, so that's true. You might not realize it, but the sheep and the sheep pen are an example or an illustration of Gauss's flux law. Imagine these are electrically charged sheep. And imagine the pen is the closed surface. And let's apply Gauss's flux law to the electrical, electrically charged sheep, sheep and the, um, the pen that is gonna be the closed surface. What Gauss's flux law would say in this situation is, is the charge of the sheep that's inside the pen that contributes the, to the net flux through the surface. And this, this sheep that's outside the pen, that does not contribute to the net flux through the, um, the, the, the pen, through the closed surface. And so it's illustrating this very important point. If you've got some surface in some arrangement of charges. It's only the ones inside that contribute to the net flux, the total flux through that surface. The ones outside don't contribute to the net flux or the total flux through the surface. So that's why we stick the subscript inside on the charge when we calculate the, uh, calculate the net flux. Oh, okay, I want to demonstrate Gauss's flux law. No, uh, so I've got to put my camera on. Hold on. Okay. Just, just came back from Home Depot. And at Home Depot, I bought an electrical charge. And here's the electrical charge. 
And um, you can see the, the charges here in this sphere, so a number of coulombs. And here are the field lines that are emerging through the, um, from the charge. So this, this charge is a positive charge. I bought, they, were, they had both types, positive and negative. At Home Depot, I bought the positive. And so these field lines are coming out of this charge. So this is a charge. Now, here I got a closed surface, or I'm about to close it. It's the box I bought the charge in. And so if I put the charge inside the box and make the surface closed, then, although you can't see it, the flux, the, the flux of the field that's passing through the surface of this box is in proportion to the charge I put inside the box. And it's just that charge times four pi times the Coulomb constant, that's the flux, or that charge divided by the permeativity of free space, that's the constant. So there is a net flux through the walls of this box. If I take that charge out, I take the charge out and I've thrown it on my desk over here with my coffee. Now I've got the box. So the charge is in the neighborhood of the box. Maybe I'll show you it's in the neighborhood of the box. But here's the charge. It's in the neighborhood of the box, but now it contributes nothing to the total flux through the box because it's outside of the box. And so that's a demonstration of Coulomb, uh, of Gauss's, Gauss's law. And just to show you even more, this applies to, that was a nice rectangular box, you know, and I had done a calculation for a nice rectangular cube. But here I got a very, you know, random kind of closed surface. It's the, I, I took this out of my waste bin in my office, right? And I can put the charge inside that And once I get that charge inside that closed surface, which is really more difficult than I thought, so now it's inside that surface. I can never tell where the camera is. Okay, so the charge is inside that surface. The flux through this closed surface is again, just proportional to the charge inside that closed surface. It's the same flux that's through the cube because it's the same charge inside this blob-like weird shaped closed surface. Now, if I take the charge out, which is also proving extremely difficult. So I've got the charge outside the closed surface. Here's the closed surface, here's the charge. Now I've dropped it. Now this charge is producing no flux, no flux through this closed surface because it's outside of the closed surface. Okay. Uh, I have to make a note to practice that ahead of time before I do it again. So let's go back to the slides and I'll try and regain my composure. And let's look at an example. I, I wanna look at one example of a, I said that Coulomb's law, Gauss's law are, um, Coulomb's law and Gauss's law are different ways of describing the interactions between um, electrical charges. They're alternate ways of describing the interactions, but they're actually related to one another. And I'm just showing on this slide how they're related. So that's what I wanna do here. And in all of that, somehow I lost the pen. I want us to think about a point charge. Here it is. I want us to think about the field that's surrounding the point charge. So 
in orange here are the field lines coming in radially outwards from the positive charge. And by thinking of the field of that charge, which is like thinking in terms of Gauss's law, I want to calculate the flux through a spherical surface that's centered on the point charge. And I want to show that that flux is indeed what's given by Gauss's flux law. What I'm really showing you is, is where the four pi k comes from, that, that, um, that proportionality constant between the charge and the flux in Gauss's flux law. Okay, so let's think about this surface out here. Here's the radius of it, if I kind of drawn it nicely. And we'll just call the, the radius R. The field at that distance R from the, from the positive cho charge, well, th this was a result of Coulomb's law. It's just K times the amount of charge divided by this, the square of the distance from the charge, which would be the radius of this, um, this, this sphere here, or this spherical shell here. The area of that spherical shell, or the area of that spherical shell is four pi r squared. That's the surface area of a sphere. Well, since I know the electrical field at the surface, it's radially outwards and it has a strength kq over r squared. And I know the area of the surface is four pi times the radius of the surface squared, four pi r squared. If I want to calculate the flux through that spherical surface, all I have to do is multiply the field strength times the area to calculate the flux. So I'm going to multiply kq over r squared times 4 pi r squared. When I do that, you can see the r squareds are in the numerator and the denominator are going to cancel out. And I'm just left with 4 pi, this 4 pi here, k times q, this k and q here. And that's Gauss's flux law. It says that the flux through this spherical surface that's surrounding the charge is equal to a constant, 4 pi k, times the amount of charge inside the closed surface. And so that's an example of how Coulomb's law, description of electromagnetism, electric, electrical interactions, and Gauss's law, description of electrical interactions, are, are related to one another. Um, how would you calculate the, this, I'm just going back to the chat now, I was trying to um, uh, take a break from it for a moment, but I want to go back to it. Um, how would you calculate the area when the container has an irregular shape? We, we couldn't really calculate the area. We couldn't do a, a concrete calculation for that charge inside the waste paper basket bin. But if I just wanted the flux, all I need to know is the amount of charge. I don't need to know the details of the, you know, the shape of that um, garbage bag. Uh, I just need to know that the charge is inside that garbage bag to calculate the flux through it. And so that's the nice or useful thing about Gauss's flux law. Okay, there's a Another example here for a, a negative charge, but um, I'm not going to, I just put that in there. Uh, let's just turn to some final examples uh, of Gauss's, Gauss's law then. And so that's the last 15 minutes. I'm just going to work through a few examples that I've, I've put at the end of this lecture. Okay, so here's, here's an example. is an example of Gauss's law and an application of Gauss's law. So in this example, I've got a, a positive charge here at the center. And it's creating an electrical field in its neighborhood, in the surrounding space. And we can see the field lines. Remember the field is strong if you're close to the charge and, and much weaker if you're far from the charge. And then it points radially outwards. So that's, that's what the, um, the field looks like. 
I then imagine three surfaces, three closed surfaces. So you've got to imagine that they're, although I'm kind of drawing a two-dimensional picture of them, imagine that they're actually, you know, three-dimensional surfaces. Um, there's this rectangular one downstairs here, this guy. And so it's like a, a rectangular shape that's immersed in this field. There's this spherical one over here on the, um, the right here. And there's this kind of horseshoe shaped, horseshoe-ish shaped one here. That's um, in the neighborhood of the charge. So they're all immersed in this field of the single point charge. And they're all, um, you know, some are simpler shapes than other shapes, but they're all immersed in a field that's varying in direction and it's varying in magnitude as you walk around the, um, the slide. And the question is, what is the net flux through these three shapes? So we've got shape number one, shape number two, and shape number three. What is the net flux of electrical field through these three surfaces? Now, First sight, you might think, well, this, this is not a fair question. This is way too hard a question. How can I, you know, think of, write a vector for the surfaces that make up the horseshoe or the sphere or the, or, or the rectangular shape? And then how can I multiply it by the electrical field, which in some places is stronger and some places is weaker and is pointing in di different directions? I can't do that. And I can't do it either. I couldn't figure out the flux through these surfaces that way either. But with Gauss's flux law, we don't need to know the details of a closed shape to calculate the flux through the closed shape. We just need to know whether the charge is inside or outside the closed shape. And if you look at these three cases, the charge isn't inside shape number one. It's outside it. It's in the neighborhood of it, but it isn't inside it. The charge isn't outside, isn't inside shape number two. It's outside it. And the charge isn't inside shape number three. It's outside it. It's just above it. And so if the charge isn't in any of these shapes, the net flux, net electric flux through these three different shapes is actually just zero. It's just this answer here because the charge was never in these. Now, Different bits and pieces of the shapes do have field lines, do have electrical field passing through them, but the net flux, the total flux is zero. Uh, as an example, right, this field line here, this one coming radially outwards to the right, that goes in this side of shape number two, but comes out the right-hand side of shape number two. So it contributes nothing to the flux. This field line that goes vertically upwards, it goes in the bottom of the horseshoe and comes out the top of the horseshoe. So it contributes nothing to the flux. And so we were able to figure that the flux, net flux was zero through all of those shapes. Okay, let's have a better of a quiz. I'm running out of time here. So let's have a quiz. Okay, so let me go ahead and answer this question. This is a similar example about Gauss's flux law. In this one, we got two charges. There's a positive one over here on the left. There's a negative one over here on the right. And then we got three surfaces. Uh, the small one here is labeled A. The larger spherical one here is labeled B. And this biggest, oval shape one, that's labeled C. And the question is about the, the flux through the, um, the, the net flux, net electric flux through the three surfaces. So the Gauss's law states that the electric flux through a closed surface is just dependent on the uh, charge inside the closed surface. It, it doesn't depend on the 
you know, the shape of the closed surface, the size of the closed surface. It only depends on which charges are inside the closed surface, and it gets no contribution from charges outside the closed surface. So if you look at these three shapes, A contains the positive charge, but not the negative charge. B contains the positive charge, but not the negative charge. So there will be a flux. There's net charge inside A and B. It's the positive charge. There will be a flux through those two guys. So their flux is not zero. But look at C. C contains some charge, but the total charge inside C is one positive charge and one negative charge that add up to zero total charge inside C. And because there's zero total charge inside C, C there's no net flux through C. And so that's this answer here. So this is a case where A and B, because they have a net charge inside them, have a net flux through them. And C, which has no net charge inside it, although it does have a positive and a negative, equal and opposite, it has um, zero net flux through. OK. <clears throat> Last. Uh, five minutes, I want to answer this question. It's pretty quick, I think. And maybe just make a remark about conductors. Um, so in this problem, we've got a, we've got a, like we've gone to Egypt, but we haven't really gone to Egypt because this is not the shape of a pyramid. So I take that back. Um, but anyway, we've gone to, you know, look at this tetrahedron, which has four sides to it, the back, the left, the right, and the bottom, that are all triangles. That's how you make a tetrahedron. And inside this closed surface, we put a single positive charge right at the center. And it's, we're told it's 1.6 nanocoulombs. And we're asked to figure out the electric flux through the entire tetrahedron. Didn't mean to do that through the entire tetrahedron and each face. Again, this is going to be an example of Gauss's law. It would be very hard. I don't think I could do it. Um, very hard to calculate the flux through this tetrahedron or a surface on it by figuring out the electrical field at the surface and then figuring out the flux through the surface. And again, the problem is that the electrical field strength and direction varies over the surface. So it'd be a very hard calculation, but we can use Gauss's flux law to find the flux through actually both the entire tetrahedron and each of the faces. So let's, let's see how we do that. It's not hard. So, there's two parts of this problem because we've got to answer the flux through the entire surface and we've got to answer the flux through each of the four faces. The flux through the entire surface is just based on Gauss's law. And, and the flux through the individual surfaces, the four surfaces, I would say that's based on a sort of concept or an idea of the symmetry of the tetrahedron and where the charge was placed inside the tetrahedron. So let's, let's see how that works. So I'm gonna start with the, the flux through the entire tetrahedron. And I'm gonna calculate that, the total flux with Gauss's flux law. So here it is where this Q is the charge inside. Now, in this case, this Q, the charge inside, is the 1.6 nanocoulomb charge, positive charge. All I got to do is multiply it by 4 times pi times the Coulomb constant, that's 9 times 10 to the 9 Newton meter squared per, per Coulomb squared. And if I do that product, I didn't write out all the numbers, I get 181 Newton meter squared per Coulomb as the flux through the surface. So that's the answer to the first part. And it was easy. This was easy with Gauss's flux law. Now, what about the flux through each of the sides? Maybe we think about this side over here on the right. May, no, that's the left. Maybe we think about this side over here on the right. That is the right. 
here, if the charge is placed at the center and we've got this symmetric arrangement of a surface, a tetrahedron that's built out of four equal sides, it means by symmetry, symmetry arguments, by geometry, geometry arguments, that that total flux of 181 Newton meter squared per coulomb must actually be shared equally between the, um, the four faces. So the top must get a quarter of it, the back must get a quarter of it, the left and right must also get a quarter of it. And so if I want the flux through a particular side, all I got to do is divide the total flux by four. They're all going to get their fair share. And so they all get a quarter of 181, and that's, that's, that's 45 Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. And so that's a, a second example of, um, of Gauss's law. Okay, let me um, just summarize then. Today's class, we introduced the concept of electrical flux. It was really building on the prior class concepts of electrical field. And both electrical flux and electrical field are useful concepts in understanding electrical interactions. Um, we saw that flux relates to a surface immersed in an electrical field, whereas field is referring to a a point in an electrical field. And we define the flux in terms of the field. That's how we started. But then we introduced a new law, a new law of physics, a new law of electricity that defined the flux through a closed surface, a particular type of surface, as in proportion to the charge inside the closed surface. We looked at examples of both the definition, concept of flux, where we calculate flux from electrical fields, and also Gauss's law, where we calculate the electrical flux through a closed surface in terms of the charge inside the closed surface. 